Welcome to Construction Cash Flow. The faster cash flows, the faster wealth grows. I'm your host, Stu Davidson, and I'd like to take a moment to introduce our incredible sponsor, Know Your Numbers. Understanding your cash flow is the cornerstone of success. It's what construction cash flow and Know Your Numbers are all about. For more about Know Your Numbers, click the Know Your Numbers link in the podcast notes to start your journey of financial enlightenment that could literally transform your business. In this episode, I'm privileged to host Dr. Raphael Dua. Six decades in the game and a lifetime achievement award to prove it. Arguably the world's foremost planner, he's orchestrated everything from nuclear submarine assembly to skyscraper construction and hospital builds. We'll dive into foul-proof planning and cash flow mastery. Prepare for game-changing insights you can't afford to miss. Tell us, Raf, tell us your story. Tell us about your story, how you got to where you are now, some of the challenges and successes along the way. Right. Well, I'm an Italian Australian. My family's been in Australia over 140 odd years. The I can't say I'm Italian because I was born in Melbourne. My however, my father was born in the United States, my grandfather was born in Adelaide, my great grandfather was born in Adelaide, and my great great grandfather, but my great great grandfather was born up in the Alto DJ in northeastern Italy. And so we're mountain people, which makes us live a long time. And we start early. Now, I started in the computer business. I'm not too certain what I'm supposed to be because the family are grape growers. We also farm. I'm a software person, but I was in the Navy. I'm highly defensed. I had 10 years in medicine. I did 10 years with Telstra. So I'm kind of eclectic's a good word. And I started with probably most of your audience wouldn't have been born. When I started, we went to the UK in 1954, and I joined a company called British Tabulating Machine. And they were basically data processing punch cards. I am still a solid punch card person. And the strange thing, do you know more punch cards used today than ever when we used to make several million per week? Because people forget about their lotto cards. They don't understand when they get on a plane. They've got a boarding pass. So people keep telling me, oh, you're so out of date, ref. You know, you're bloody old. And I tell you what, we never had the errors then that we get now. And if you, <laughs> I think if you haven't exactly. had a data processing background, using a computer is now. It's, people don't understand how to move data. And the thing that I'm, I'm a project planner, cost control scheduler, but I'm also a software writer. And in, when I was in British Tab, we programmed using wires on a board and it was 915975 this will mean nothing to most people but it excites me which is what it's got to do and we actually started building a little mainframe wouldn't call that then which had 1024 marconi tubes as the americans will want and we actually programmed the thing using tabulators our data was input through punch cards and we wanted to do a calculation the little old, we ran it around the wires. Oh, you need output. So he pushed it out and punched cards. So I spent two or three years doing that, learning how to make data work. And then someone discovered my father was in the US Navy. And I have a, a slight bent towards being mathematical. And somehow I finished up in the United States on the Fleet Ballistic Weapon Project, uh, commonly called the Polaris Ballistic. The reason for that was because I could program using wires on a plug board, using punch cards in and out. And the people from Sperry Rand, they were using British tabulating machines, data entry devices. They wouldn't buy from IBM. There was only BTM and IBM. And IBM and BTM was kind of that close together. So that got me to meet people like Kelly and Walker. And I, I met the guys from Booz Allen Hamilton. So I was actually at the grand age of 17, I was actually involved in the original critical part. 
calculations, wow. arrow diagramming, and I still believe in it. I still run it. All my software uses it and PDM and PERT. So from there, we we started becoming more and more well known throughout Europe as BTM, and of course HEC one, HEC two, and then we started building HEC four. By this time, IBM suddenly has come out with a computer, and so because we were in the states, with three or four of us, and RCA. Do you remember RCA, Radio Corporation America, used to make, they were making a computer. And somehow we supplied the front bits, they supplied the central processing bits, and a thing called the 1500 appeared. It was, it was known as the 301. Now we started, it was a programmable computer. And so we started writing a machine code, which was called 1500 assembly. And so we had to, we also got to meet um, she was commander Grace Hopper. And of course, if you say that today, they go, oh, yeah, who the heck's that? Well, she's the lady that invented COBOL. So with your great beard, oh. I think you should, you should better remember. And she became an admiral at the end of her career. So that's pretty cool. And we wrote her own yeah. compiler, our own Fortran compiler. And by this time, we're getting a bit close to Baranti. And so the, the ICT, as we then became in 1959, we all went back to the UK and we'd moved, the company had moved from 17 Park Lane. We used to be in a very posh building in a Georgian building in Park Lane in the middle of London with a computer. The, the next computer we were going to do needed cooling. So we found ourselves down by the River Thames and the Putney Bridge and we got the computers. So my cousin David and I, we wrote based on RCA's PERT package, we wrote 1500 series PERT package. Um, it meant program evaluation and review technique in those days. People loosely use this term today when they mean precedence diagramming method. And that's kind of, kind of like saying that my key SUV is a Rolls Royce. But they, no, it's not the same. So we wrote a lot of software during 60, 61, 62. And for some good reason, somebody thought uh, that uh, I should go and join the Operations Research Society. So all the critical pass software in the UK came out of the Operation Research Society, which was heavily biased towards IBM. Now, we're the UK, or quote, the British computer company. So it caused some interesting things, and I just got ignored because I was 10 years younger than Albert Battersby and Keith Lockyer, and I could name forever and a day. But we worked out a series of maths, and we started resource allocation. And we started nutting out how we could write those algorithms so that we could schedule tasks. Believe it or not, we had a, a, a gentleman from George Wimpy's. We were in Putney Bridge and they were in Hammersmith, so you could get to, which you believe was a trolley bus. Yeah, we used to come down Bullet Palace Road. They were very keen on having something that would schedule the resources, because in those days they used day labor. So you need to know how many chippies, how many sparks, how many of whatever you needed in order to get it finished on time. And we worked, we wrote the software, we got them doing it, and we delivered projects. It was really cool. They, we did it, and out they came. We used to draw it on butcher's paper. We didn't have the graphics devices in those days. And then, of course, we had to write data sheets. And then, of course, ah, you've got to turn them into a punch card. Ah, who's going to do that? So then we got young ladies. We had a punch run. They were all left over from the old data processing days. And so we used to have 20,000, 30,000, 40,000 punch cards would make up the database. We then, the Ferranti part of the company started really going strong because by 63, the TTL computers, that's transistor logic. And in those days, we had to do everything. The computer department was about 40 people. So not only we run wow. software, not only we test the software, write the compilers, we operated the computer, and when the tape drive suddenly ran, stopped, the vacuum tank had failed, we had to go into the back of the machine, pull off this rubber grommet, take out the <laughs> carbon brush, go go get it. We did everything. You know, nowadays, oh, yeah. I don't think too many people could do that stuff. And so you really learn the experience you got. And mm. then, of course, ICT, as we were called by then, we just got through the UK with the electricity generating board. And the 1900 computer was a 24-bit 
six-bit word character, and we produced what was called the ICT 1900 series PERT. By this time, we were really flying with resource scheduling, and we started to earn value. I have all these people today that keep telling me they've discovered this thing called value, and you go, really? Well, I was working on the original algorithms back in 1961, 2003. It, it hasn't changed, Daddy. It's a sad thing. We no longer look back. We don't look at history anymore. Nothing happened before the year 2000. I'm convinced of it. Well, the others seem to be. And then suddenly, I mean, I, in the meantime, being Oz, well, we, there was no such thing in those days. We were all Brits. But I met a young lady who subsequently became my wife, and, we, and I got shunted to New Zealand because, for some strange reason, Kiwis were amongst the first in the world to buy copies of 1900 Perp. And as I wasn't quite married, but was going to New Zealand to get married to a family in New Zealand. And so I finished up in New Zealand and we had all the major construction companies bought a 1900. I mean, it was absolutely fantastic. IBM was so peeved because they couldn't get in because the construction companies in the main were the leaders of industry in that time. And the electrical companies, Gooder and Company, they were good, good friends of mine. And so we just expanded. And then we started doing, well, we were already running earn value. People find it, they just don't believe me. How could you draw a curve? Easy, on a line printer. I still have my original manuals, if anybody will ever look at them. And so we just grew and grew and grew. And then ICO in Australia said, you've got to, have, or I see, you've got to come back. Because I only went away for two years. And 11 years later, well, you know how it is. You sort of do this stuff. And then beside, we had a bambina. And so we thought we'd better come home. So then we really roared to Australia, Pacific. I actually managed to do a pile of time in the Navy as a submariner. And so we did all the maintenance. There used to be a shipbuilding yard on the Clyde called Scott's, and they built the Oxley, which I traveled around on a bit. And the Oberons were a nice submarine. And if you like that sort of thing, that's one of my main things in life is submarines and We've now got this thing called AUKUS, which means BA Systems up at Barrow, which used to be Vickers. Vickers Barrow used to own 25% of ICT. So, of course, they're a late there for doing far more complex scheduling, planning, cost controls, resource scheduling. And because the Brits weren't too keen about their own machine, IBM really started to hammer us. And as time went on, while I was down here, we totally ran around, sold about 1,691 copies of 1,900 per, and, and that used to cost £42,000 per month to rent, and you had to sign up for 60 months. I got into submarine maintenance, submarine rebuilding. Then, of course, we got the skimmers, or the targets, as we like to call them. And then that went on into shipbuilding for people in the UK because we developed some very neat things, but it was Vickers Cockatoo Dockyard. So we had a naval dockyard facility owned by a British company, but it had a 100% contract with the Royal Australian Navy, or the government rather. It, it's like all projects, you need to know the environment. You need to know what you're going to build right or whatever. You need to know those parameters and the boundaries. And as I always say, Where's the 50 cent O ring? Because in 1986, you remember, challenge blew up because a little, little piece failed. I started using earned value as we started writing the Australian standard. And we were the first in the world because we were building some new submarines here in Australia. And so I sort of, by this time, I'd been in ICL UK, what, almost 30 years. The world had changed. PCs were coming out, or were out, in fact. We were getting, they were getting chewed up by IBM and various PCs. And I personally preferred the Macintosh. And with micro planning that we started in Bristol, of all places, at Westbury on Trim, basically because there were three really cool pubs. And, and we actually were sitting over the top of a pub. So if you want to just walk downstairs, Ooh, go to his home. Cool. That's yeah. a long time. Yeah. I don't it's all gone. That whole corner of Westbury and Trim's all vanished. So we wrote Microplanner, which was inheritance from the Pert on the 1200, 1500, 1900, BME, and 
I was having all the graphics, and there was about 20 people. It was, I mean, it was just growing like crazy. And we, we had the second or third Apple computer. So we went on there because you could draw. And Critical Path, I don't know how much you've done, but nobody yeah, knows some. how to draw a logic diagram anymore. And without a proper logic diagram, you cannot plan a project. And yeah, it, we it used really... to do I remember at uni, we used to do them. Yeah. Oh, I still run them. I've got graphics. Yeah. I've got my own plotters and, and various things. Well, tell us a bit more about micro planning, because one of the things I see, particularly from a cash, point, a cash flow perspective, is many are rooted in delays, disruptions, uh, leading to oh, disruption. Yeah, I mean, it's it's amazing how, you know, there's very little understanding of what makes, you know, what the dependencies are, how to do proper president's planning. And, you know, people just plug things into a computer these days and don't really know all the nuts and bolts behind it. Like yourself, you know, with the, you know, with, with the punch cards and understanding, you know, how things work and, you know, what, how sequencing works. What do you, why do you think it is? I mean, in the UK here, I would say 80 or 90% of projects don't go to schedule or, or go over, go over time, go into oh, absolutely. Uh, delays and disputes. And why is it with, you know, with all that knowledge that's there or all, you know, with all the technology that should be there for planning a project, why do you think we're seeing, we're still seeing so many delays, uh, sequencing problem, interface problem, you no, know, and it happens on most projects. And then I think it's a lack of understanding how these things fit together. The industry in the UK around disputes over delays is a five billion pound industry. So where does all that come from? And well, why do you I think that know, is I'm, then, Raf? Yeah, I make a lot of money <laughs> out of peer reviewing. That's because we don't plan. The example is when we built the Collins Pass in Australia, it never been done. No, no manufacturing capability. Um, I was fortunate because I was at Vickers Cockatoo to be part of the team. And then we won the contract in 1987. And we then spent three solid years working out what the heck it was, design, plan, plan, plan. how are you going to do this? We knew how to take a submarine apart. We knew how to put it together. We knew all. And by the way, technology is going faster than we can, can do it. And so we looked at, we were going to build 12 boats. Government cut back the money. Basically, the problem is, with all due respect to everybody, which means I'm about to insult them, um, is that no one's bothered to put the effort in. At 40, they're all experts. They know everything and do not wish to spend any money which might impinge on their bonus and why should i pay I mean, in the good old days i mean i was getting 250 300 an hour you can't get that anymore we've let too many people in have done who are now the world's micro experts they've done a three-day primavera course and we yeah. can get them for 30 bucks an hour and you you know construction yeah. has and all the all projects i mean i take it you've heard of bent Livberg very famous professor at Oxford Uni in the school of the Edward Said School of Business Management. He upset the British government so much by telling them between the eyeballs why projects fail and that he was then talking 70%. And then, in fact, the moment you've got a project, you are wrong by 30%. If you said the project's going to cost 100 time periods in duration, it's 130 and if you say it's 100 units of money, it'll be 130. Rubbish. Sharpen your pencil, the project director will say. Makes it 90. So, excuse me, where did the 40 go? It's called an extension of time claim. The lawyers and the accountants are running what you and I do. What happened to the Connie Surveyor? I still believe in the QS. I'm one of the founder members of the Guild of Project Controls. And we started off basically as a lot of QSs, planners and schedulers, it's got 150 odd thousand members and people don't understand a bill of materials. They don't understand work breakdown structure. They don't understand the contractor work breakdown structures. Nobody's bothering to read ISO 2158. They don't want to read, but you have to read and learn and understand. Why can't I just ping it on my phone? And you've got people who seriously tell you they can run a 
building site, but they go around with the camera and they got a bit of stuff that says how much you've done. And I said, well, what was it you put in the computer in the first place to actually describe what's going on? Oh, we use a template. Right. Now, who designed the template? Oh, we just got it off the net. Or oh, we do, we Googled it down, right? And you go, so what are you building? Oh, we're doing a 10-story hospital. So what does your system say it's doing? Oh, it's doing a commercial building. Well, I've built 40 hospitals in my time. And I think if you look at a hospital and you look at a commercial multi-story office block, not really the same. No, no, the durations are different. And have you ever tried fitting out an operating theatre? And have you? And do you know? Do you understand the law? Do you understand what you're? See, people don't know what they're building. They can't read a two-dimensional drawing anymore. And we, because BIM does it right. When did you last see a BIM thing done? I haven't seen one in five years. You know, we've got this yeah. 4D, but then some clowns come out with 12D. And when they talk about the database, I did, I'm a simple soul, X, Y, Z, or Z, sorry, because I'm going to UK. There's, people, we only do 60, 70% of a scope. Now, I've done a lot of work in Dubai, and, and for my sins, I do work for a mob called KSA. And everybody down here goes, ah! and KSA means the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Um, but we all do the work in Dubai because it's extremely good fees. And I've been, because I'm seriously too well known, for building medical facilities. And we're in the middle of building a massive medical knowledge village. Now, I said to them, how much money have you got? And the thing in, in at that stage, they've got more zeros and you take a stick out. So you put a number you want at the front and you're never going to run out because you've got plenty of money. They insisted on a two to five year. We're still doing this. I went over there in 2020 and we still haven't got any hold in the ground. And in the meantime, hospital operating theatres have gone from 44 to 55 to 66 square metres. Operating tables have, got, have now had to cater for up to 180 kilogram bodies, whereas most of them, and still probably many hospitals in the UK, will maybe get lucky to 100. And of course, they collapse, don't they, when you bang a 120 stone person on kilos. But they don't have the knowledge of the product and or the scope or all of it. And they hop into Microsoft Project, oh, I'm going to murder them. You, you see, you don't need to know anything with MS Project. You get in there and you drive it like it's Excel. When's it going to start? On the 13th? When's it going to finish? On the 26th? Oh, look, it's given us the duration, right? <laughs> Hang on. How'd you, how'd you know that's five days long? But what was the word? Hmm. Now what's it going to draw? I don't know. So you then get a to-do list. And this is nowadays is what people call scheduling. And the sad thing is we'd all... Uh, in Australia at the moment, the previous government, which was very dodgy as it's now turning out to be, um, has given away a million visas to come to Australia in this sort of area from countries north of us that are not terribly English speaking. So they have no idea of how we build. And in my home state here of Victoria, you know, I'm trying to think, who was, who was that mining union leader, Maggie Thatcher, had a problem with? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, we've got a bloke called John Sector, and he runs the construction union. And I tell you something, if you don't understand what they get up to, I've never had any trouble because I know he likes the red and my family produces red wine. And so you happily go and sit in the donger and you share a glass and say, well, tell us how you want to build this. You tell me what you think is going to happen. And I go, by the way, John, where is the safety? Your guys are not wearing long trousers. It's very hot. You fought the systems. We'd have long trousers. Now we get the 25 and 30-year-olds naked. And then 30, they're down with melanomas. And lots of them parking at 40. And you sort of, you, you get in to understand how, but now your accounting company, PHG, or sadly in Australia, Christ Coopers, who've been, Pinged for stealing government money. It's probably, it's all around the world what they've been up to. And they will come along and 
we'll send our senior scheduling consulting bloke out. Used to be me at sometimes, and they charge two and a half, three thousand dollars a day, and that person will oversee it. And then, then we will. They will only be here for three to four weeks only. Get it all set up, and then we'll put some lower price resources in. And we'll only we'll only charge you a thousand a day for those people. See, so we go. Oh wow, getting a bargain. And the problem is they're only they're only paying that person four hundred a day. And they think yeah. they've just they've run into luxury. They you know they they're used to having say twenty bucks a day. And this is one of the things we it's causing me problems in Dubai right now. These resources are colloquially known in our part of the world as blue boiler suits. I don't know where the phrase came from. The Arabs aren't keen on them. <laughs> but where we looked at how we're going to do the work on this eleven hectare site. And we're going to have hotels. There's going to be ten-story, four cardiology theatres on the floor. So, if you've got a dicky ticker, and what happens, mm. depending on the seriousness of whatever you're going to do, when you've been taken out, they don't keep you in hospital. They flick you across next door on a bridge into the Hyatt. And so, and then as you get better, you're downgraded down the hotel. So you can walk out the front door and go and play on the golf course, all in ten days. Wow, that's pretty good going. That's the theory. Yeah. What yeah. actually has happened is we got a fair bit of the work done, and one of the kingdom's princes had organised Halliburton, and Halliburton had priced this job on American rates of three hundred and fifty USD an hour, regardless, and there's three point nine million men hours. Let alone oh. the cost of materials. This is just, and what yeah. happened? They they got a bit upset with Halliburton after Iran and Iraq and wherever they got chucked off the job. And what has happened? That particular job is scheduled to finish on the thirty first of August, two thousand and seventeen. It's currently spent only thirty eight percent of the budget, and it's about thirty five percent complete. And nobody's upset. Simple reason is COVID. Couldn't sell the building. It's all flats and goodness knows, harbour and yachts. Mm. And it takes them a week to do one hour plan by the US trading. And what happens when you look at the S curves, because I run all the Earth schedule, mm. I use Earn Schedule, Walt Lipke, brilliant bloke in the States, good friend. And um, this is with earned value, when you get your schedule, when you SPI, Starts getting close to one. The 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 costing because of the value the ratios you use screws the SPI up, and so you're showing that you're on time only you're not, and because of the way the arithmetic gets overridden by. So earned schedule uses the same ratios and tells you more about what's happening to your schedule. So that's the environment I work in. But the people now, the marketplace, why we fail is because. You need one a lot of experience to know how often and who what your trades do, and it doesn't matter if you're building your steel ships, writing computer software. When I was in ICL, we had to write a hundred coding lines every hour, and we were only allowed one coding error in one thousand lines. If you got to five coding errors, they thought you probably needed. Another job that you weren't really quite suited、mm. to writing, and the thing is, we gathered around. I mean, COVID's caused a lot of problems, but I made a lot of money. I mean, I was quite pleased about it. I sat here, but sadly, my wife died seven years ago, so I, I've just basically got a huge house. Yeah, you know, the girls come every now and again, but I got a big dining room table sitting there, and I've turned this whole corner. I got five laptops here, and sixty-six size screens because I can't read those. Little defence machines down there, and so I draw, and I still do things. And I st- the micro planner, which we've we actually trusted a couple of people too many, who took advantage and did all sorts of nasties, and almost got them to jail, but didn't quite. It seems people in their thirties, thirty-five these days, ah,、uh, they are not as honest as they used to be. Let's continue with our fascinating discussion in a moment. 
but first I'd like to give listeners the opportunity to dive into a world of financial enlightenment with our sponsor, Know Your Numbers. If you want to master your numbers and unlock your business's true potential, and if you're ready to take control of your financial destiny, click the Know Your Numbers link in the podcast notes to find out more. In the meantime, let's get back to our guest. You remember when, when I was a young lad, yeah, a banker, oh my goodness me, you know, bank manager, mm. the accountant. These yeah. were people you looked up to. Now the banker's probably fiddling you. Well, it's often the case because you can keep reading the financial papers. But it, it's understanding what the client's trying to do. And Agile's completely killed it. Agile is an old system. And one of the strange things that I have great joy in telling the 25 to 30 year olds who've discovered Kanban. Wow, yellow. And I go, you do know that a guy called Edward Demon in 1947 invented it, Toyota, so they could plan motor cars through their factory. Now we have Jira at Atlassian and we've got DevOps, Azure DevOps. You've got all these things and you can never see more than two weeks in front of you. So like most of my projects that I've been doing lately, which are in the 20 billion mark, they're 10 or 15 years long because they're big defense projects. They don't happen overnight. Yeah, it takes you three years to build a submarine and you've got one going and halfway through that, you start the second. And so by the time the other one's out, you started your third. And so everything's staggered. This means I can keep all my resources working flat strap. So it's, it, it's understanding how scheduling works. And no, yeah. AI won't help it. And now people are going, oh, we need, we've got to be agile to get this done in time. But um, misuse of the word, because what they're about agile is we've got to be quick and get what we're doing, but we still want what's now called waterfall. Oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. You need an integrated logic critical path. I do arrow, I do precedence, and I do in both languages. Precedence will never give you an accurate result, ever, if you use start to start and finish to finishes. If you can imagine your head, I've got one of these weird brains and memories. If you've got two activities, activity A is 10 days long, and activity B is five days long. But when I've done one day of A, I can start B. I cannot finish B. There's one day of B left when I finished A. So it's going to be naught to 10. Now, naught plus one is one. One plus five is six. It can't finish till time 11, can it? 10 plus one is 11. But you're showing early finish of six. What they do in Primavera, Marks and all these other products, they stretch the end out and they subtract the duration. So instead of having an early start of one, which is I want to get my project running, you finish up with an early start of five or six rather. So they delay the start. So I call it lag drag. I've done a lot of papers on it. And nobody seems to have woken up to this. So what they then do, because it looks obviously weird, you now have an activity that's got minus three days. And mm. it's against the rules. DCMA and ISO and all the all these standards we work to, you can't do negative finish start. I mean, how do you go backwards? I mean, who's Dr. Who at the moment? But you probably need him. Yeah. Who owns the negative free time, you know, Matt? Who owns the float? Yeah. Nobody. You've got to read me. And I, and, and the idiots that I tell understand it. The moment you go into resource scheduling, that there is no float. It, here's a message for you, young Stu. When you're setting up your project, now, you see, if you do Arrow, it's like a barbell, right? I have an event, early time, late time. Early time, late time. I have an activity. Early start, late start, early finish, late finish. Get eight sets of dates. If I have another activity terminating my J node, my first activity might have been five days long, but the one coming into the end is seven days long. So now I've got two days float on the activity. Now, if I can delay the early start without crunching the successor early start, I have early free float, not free float. It's early free float, delay the early start. Now, when you get into an argument, you see, this is really important in delay analysis and extension of time. 
And then when you come backwards, see, Microsoft Project does not calculate the backward pass correctly. And if you have, because it's precedence and it only has early time, early start, late start, early finish, late finish, it hasn't got, you can't move the box, if, if you can imagine this in your head, you know, that you can't stretch. And then you see you have late pre flow on the backward pass. And then if a forward activity could be laid to its latest and I start the succeeding activities earliest, normally they would overlap because they, you've pushed, pushed to your late and they have crashed into the successor early. If that doesn't occur and there's still spare time, it's called independent flow. I mean, it's in all the books ever since 1960. We've been explaining the mass. I stick it on the thing, but nobody's programming, only microplanner does it. And I still do lots and lots of arrow diagramming. And then you just do a Gantt chart out of it and don't produce the links. But nobody understands the math. People can't do the forward and backward pass. They stuff information into the computer. Nobody checks the results. I mean, it, it's great. I can make 250 Australian dollars or 120 pound. I do loads and loads of, I do early peer review, not delay analysis. I do forward analysis. So before you start the project, I got lots of papers. You're going to, you're going to regret this. We did this for a metal bashing mob that was fixing up earth moving equipments. I worked on a big gold mine. They wouldn't let you take any samples out, which was a bit of a pain. But what <laughs> happened that they were really going gate guns and we had to really push all the big yellow machinery out. And and we set up with the calendars and the times and the people and we said, we've got to shorten one and lengthen another because I want us continuous resource. Because I'm in the middle of the, it's a remote area, it's 350k west of Sydney, not a lot of people about. And so I'm busy trying to, so once that resourcing is going, there's no flow. You have to start the activity when the program says so. You've got to finish the activity when the program says so. You start the next one. So excuse me, why are you late? Why have you got a delay? So, in, so we look at it at the front end and there is always going to, in a logic diagram, there's always going to be a location within it that is not as critical as someone else. And I take everything up to 10 days as critical because it's so easy to slip a bit and mm -hmm. you get all the you get these people oh you've got to run the critical path now scheduling is i wrote it's like churchill said you know planning is everything but plans aren't and when i see where things are sitting and where they're going and i go the likelihood of this critical path that's using an awful lot of concrete i'm using a lot of this and a lot of that and I know down the road there's another building going on, and these guys are itinerant to go backwards and forwards. In comes the old uh, ready mix. And how do I know that ready mix will come to me first in the morning rather than the site down the road? So all of a sudden, I got an activity that's critical that doesn't start. Now, if you haven't built in 30% management reserve, I build management reserve into all my planning. And we did that in ICO in the old days when we said we would deliver something, software package, whatever. I only ever allocated 10 weeks worth of work in a 13-week elapsed time. People don't understand there's a difference between duration and elapsed time. Yeah, And absolutely. so when you start having, yeah. like, when I'm going forward, I go, well, where is it going to be the most soft part? And what I would do is to make sure that how those trades, if they're the same trades on my more critical parts, of course, the algorithm has actually made sure I've got them, but the way it will allocate the resources, it uses the flow. First thing I use in Microplanner and on the 1900 VME mm. was the early free flow because the first thing that's going to happen is you're going to be late. Nobody yeah. starts on time, and you get this ludicrous thing that happens in MS Project where people... They've got a one-day activity, and then they status it at 17%. Yeah. So you finish up with calendar creep. Nobody ever knows that. So I look at all those things at the beginning, and I say to the client, this network is not very healthy. So I use products like Acumen Fuse, 
my good mates in uh, up in Hull, Nick Hartsworth. I use XER Toolkit, Schedule Toolkit. I use Schedule Inspector. I use Project Tracker. I got my mate Ronnie Winter in Florida with his Scheduled Delay Analysis. I pass, before we say that it was good, I whack it through about eight or nine different packages. They all do something kind of different, and mm. I amalgamate yep. that up and yep. showed a client and said, well, you know, mm. this project, you're spending $1.5 million every single day, six days a week. Wouldn't it be sensible to have some people who can control this? or do? Because they always chop them off. And then the other thing that makes your project late is an accident. Any mm. LTIs, lost time injuries, in Australia, yeah. you can now go to jail. You can in the UK. Oh, yeah. You're on a building site. Oh, it never used to cost much. Now, in this state, it's a 20 year jail sentence and it will go to the managing director. They said, well, the foremans don't have charge. What happens is the project director has said, sharpen your pencil. I want this done by now. Don't worry about the saving. Push that electric work platform just to. You know, it won't fall over. We'll have some mm. votes. So the construction unions have become very, very strong as a result of the fatalities. Um, fortunately, we're not as bad as you because the government here has really tightened it up. But when I was fairly young and working in construction, if it was a 15-storey building, which was unusual back then, we would say we'll lose, we'll have one death every floor. It was the standard. There were no harnesses. And now you see these young blokes because what happens is the schedule's getting tight and the schedule mm. was created tight. So now the schedulers have got to be careful. They need to get pulled in now because it can't be built in the time they've said. And drainage can be a real pain. And so suddenly you start looking at this and it's not happening. You've got to say, well, that's within reach of one of the – because we – we can do a 15-ton mobile crane up to 100 metres, 125 metres, only cost you 25 grand an hour. But you're, you, if you fail, there's a $20 million fine. What's the cheapest? So in my planning, we've got to have all the safety nets. You've got to have anchor points. And as I saw somebody on a 80-storey building that was finished here recently, they had a guy come down, but fortunately he fell into the net and he dropped about five or six metres. They fastened his safety harness to a door frame. It appears to me, especially speaking to yourself today, that there's such lack of knowledge in terms of how to schedule, programme, plan a project, generally, really, and a lack of knowledge, a lack of experience. You know, the listeners to the podcast, I mean, they might be medium-sized contractors or particularly supply chain subcontractors they'll be very interested in how they can now start to what they can do to 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 plan projects better both sides really if they're a contractor that's responsible for scheduling all the work or even i know you mentioned earlier about you know understanding the way the subby works and, and in previous episodes we've talked about subcont the importance of subcontractors having their own terms and conditions because they're the ones that really know their trade you know but then they're very rarely they're introduced to the project planning process you know if a brick laying there's brick laying on a block of flats and there's the, there's the complexities around the interfaces of brick brick supports and 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 insulation and working around balconies and all of these things that haven't been taken into account yet yeah, if they'd spoken to the brick lab beforehand they would have been able to say ah that will take a bit longer but that's the maximum amount of brickies absolutely you know what i'm seeing all the time is like the main contractor ends up saying oh we're behind schedule we want more blokes on site we want more blokes on site which is crazy because you know, you can only work efficiently with the right number of yeah. Yeah, people. Brooks's Law, 1979. But the thing there is, you see, they now have to show by law um, the safety work that they haven't planned it such that you're going to have six blokes standing on a thin edge. Exactly, yeah. So now you talked about micro planner, which I think sounds really, really interesting. Is that something that the kind of medium sized contractor or specialist contractor could turn to? Or where could they yeah. find out, learn more about your work, learn about micro planner, well, we, or even use micro planner? 
Yeah, we've gone into hibernation a bit. So I have a guy in the UK called, oh God, what's John's name? Anyway, I got somebody I'll put you in contact with. I don't do a huge yeah. amount. Now I'm coming up 84. Uh, I don't chase around as much as I did. You're, you're doing pretty well. You're doing pretty well, Raph. Oh, yeah. I've got a 63-year-old daughter. And people don't want the formality of doing stuff. I'm working on a defence project, and we're only allowed to use MS Project 2016. And I keep showing them the errors, the computational errors. So what I do is I build it all in Microplanner, I export a text file. But the the Microplanner is a full-blown earned value cost control system, and I was able to build 5.4 billion six submarines from 1986 to 1994 when the Americans turned up because we had a change of government who said, well, you Australians don't know what you're bloody well doing, mate. No, you've got that primavera. They, we had 1,700 copies of the software inside. It was all Macintosh. And then somebody decided you'd need an IT department. Why haven't you got any IT department? And Dr. Williams, absolutely one of the most magic people I've ever worked for, and we came from Gorman Long, bridge building people, and he was one of the world's leading welding people. And we sat down for a year to work out how we did 32 kilometres of welding on the submarine hull. And we outdid what the Swedes did. They built the first bit and we said, welding. We a whole year paid for the welders and they were paid five times as much money as any other trade on site. And they had to burn an electrode for exactly 20 minutes. Not 19.59, not 20.01, yeah. 19 minutes. Yeah. The temperature of the steel is 132 degrees. It's cherry red. By the way, guys, there's no asbestos protection. So all they had was cotton, heavy canvasy type things. They were rubbed up and they lasted. When they fit and got this, we trained them up and they did it. Um, mm. They're buggered. So they rested two hours. The next bloke comes in. Because if you, and then yeah. we have to have NDT comes in. So I've got in your timing at the micro level, the very micro plan was I had a massive high level program. But on any one day, there was never more than a couple of hundred tasks. So I had microplanner is smart because it runs some projects in the old way from the 60s. That's because I know how to do it. Not like Microsoft. They claim sub projects, but they only exist at the time you're scheduling. Then if you send the file back to the other contractors, that data is no longer there because it, it uses an alias. It doesn't work. <laughs> they Keep trying to do various things that's going on. P6 doesn't do it terribly well. And people, they don't understand the decomposition. I go to nine levels if I've got something big. And then what I, I always operate at the work package. No package is longer. Because of our JSAs and SWIMs, your job system analysis and your safe work management planning, you can't start a job until... You have a toolbox at 7.30 in the morning and the foreman or the leading hand will explain to you, this is the job we're doing. This is what it is. It's going to use this chemical. It's going to have this. It's going to do this. This is a danger. Look, that you all understand, right? I sign that you're about to commit suicide. And no, no swim can last longer than four days. So we know you'll take a week because you'll slip a bit. And always add a bit, but the swim is only valid. So if you now start running because there's a problem, like we had a flood, we're, we're putting down a 250 kVA cable basically in a creek. It wasn't when we started, but because of the weather, and and somebody damaged it, and then some bright person from overseas said, "Oh, we'll just we'll splice another bit in." And we were looking at it. This was the desal plan. That we ran a microplanner. That was 4.6 billion. I can handle, I've got no, don't create 50,000 tasks. Decompose. So I basically run an agile system in waterfall, but critical path. So I have the bits going along or from your side like that. And it rolls all up. And I, I use complex work breakdown structures. I, because I'm defence oriented, I was using the MILDEF 881A, and then I was part of the group that created Australian Standard 4817. Now, we actually created from Australia ISO, 
and the Brits took it up because they had to. They're supplying us. You've got to do this. So ISO 21500. So if you get your contract, they should be looking at all of that and how to do things. And it tells you the rules of the game. And so 21508, 21511. And at the moment, we're writing an earned value. Eight is the value, and, and 11 is about work breakdown structure. As it happened, I wrote the PMI's guidelines on work breakdown structure, and I did the same for CHEOB. Because unless you decompose your data and, and you get it down to, I never want an activity more than two weeks long. My cadence of status is a week. So the rules are you yeah. can't status greater than two weeks of your longest duration. So we keep it tight at the bottom level. And in Microplanner, I have a thing called a hammock. Now, at the moment, there's not a huge amount of stuff on, on the website because I had a problem. My wife was spent five years dying and she had serious ovarian. Now, two of my daughters have got it as well. The life has got a bit of hectic oh. since 2011. But so I sort mm. of run it back a bit. And mostly you can't convince people Unless you get the owner who wants to save his company going broke. I have lots of small home builders. I have nurses at the hospital. I used to run the hospital up here attending because my girls are nurses. Mm. And I got the nurses to run earned value performance management when none of the subbies from the builder could do it. Because they wow. listened. They understood yep. it. They didn't argue with me. Well, you don't argue with my eldest daughter because absolutely spot on very very talented girl and of course then i'm biased but we showed the nurses what they had to do and we we broke what the job they had to do done i came home four weeks early on the hospital and the owners of australia yeah. gamer and i got two first pass round the world tickets including a cruise on the inner passage up to alaska because i saved them about 1.8 million because we got the hospital open and we we were private not public but we ran a public hospital and there is you can't do it and i had every single head of department involved in the planning and the scheduling my exo my executive and i we did the physical stuff in the computer but the girls would draw the activities and then there was things like how long does it take to make a bed we got 269 beds to be made when we start, we've got 10 operating theatres. We've got so many neonates. We, we looked at the size. We, we sized the problem. Same way as we size when you're writing software. Yeah. How many instructions? You know, how big yeah. is it going to be? The person that is skilled and does the job all the time is, is perhaps the best person to tell you how long it's going to take. Now, it yeah. sounds quite a revelation, really, doesn't it? But today, there's so many people that have come out of college or university that have never seen, have never really been around how a building fits together. And they're planning major projects, uh, putting in, oh, how long does it take for a carpenter to do this? How long does it take for a bricky to do that? And they're looking up in Spons and they're going, oh, yes, yeah, Spons says it's 0.4. Yeah, that, and, and the trades on that particular job with that particular the particular idiosyncrasies on that particular job never doesn't get appointed till after all the plans done. Then he'll come in and go, yeah. of course he'll say, no, sorry, we won't be able to do that, mate. Yeah. And then the project director says, well, you're better if you want to keep on the job. And and it's silly. Exactly. I mean, I've got this. Yeah. I'm not just the only one who thinks the way I do. I've got I've got a very niche group of friends about there's about 30 of us, 20 of in the States, but a few here. And we all and there's a couple in Kiwi. And we all think the same. And we've done some massive projects using Microplanner. And the point is that the management now on the prisons in New Zealand, that was seven years in length when we started that project. In the middle of all this, I'm still doing the submarine. And then we went to Canada to build a hospital. So all you're doing is going around and around and around. Hmm. I got to be a double platinum one on Qantas in about nine months. And we didn't have... In, in that start, there wasn't Zoom. There wasn't stuff. Now, I don't have to bother to leave home. I can run 10 or 12 projects in a day. Now I'm fully employed. I mean, I've had, this is my second job. I'm working in defense still, but it's for IT. And none of them, have, I've got to be careful because they can hear me. They haven't got a clue. The, the people between 25, all oh, they're fresh graduates. 
major building companies, major companies. No, we don't want to pay for you, Raph. We'll get a uh, we'll get a, a fresh graduate. And I said, fine, it was only going to cost you a couple hundred bucks now. But when I come back and have to fix it up, which we will, it'll be five hundred dollars an hour. I'll charge you or we want to charge you 65 percent of your lawyer's hourly rate. Still saving money. Yeah. Now, Construction is an could, industry of losing money. It is actually. That is an absolutely profound thing to say because it's so true. Construction is an industry that's losing money, that's built on losing money. So it's absolutely Car crazy. Do you remember some Carillion. years ago, Carillion, that KPM Carillion put it together with, and, and they managed in 18 months they were going to improve everything and lost £9.6 billion. I always thought that was a very strange right. proof of concept. Yeah. And what, what do you think the um, the main reason for Carillion's collapse? There was uh, too much intercenine warfare. Construction is, in fact, just a sophisticated warfare system between contractors and subbies and change of materials that nobody really knows how to use. It's like all this Alucabon cladding. Oh, you didn't tell me it was going to catch fire. Now it's banned. Now, guess what? This new cladding is about three times the price of the old cladding, but the old cladding company went out of business. Yeah, this cause and effect. That's why I do forward, forward analysis. When we were doing refits and submarines, we always used to look, because you're pulling a boat apart that we didn't build, and there's 47 lives inside there, and if we cock mm. it up, there is a compulsory manslaughter charge. So it's sort of damage, yeah. please, all the time. And I tell you what, certainly focus. And we looked at every what go wrong. Well, we take well, we did something in Australia that nobody had done because or Scots they went bananas. We're going to cut a hole in the side of the hole, we're going to do this and do this. And we had some excellent engineering guys. People forget we've got some quite cool people in this country. We found several locations with computer models that were done where you could cut, and in fact, now it's common practice. And the only reason we did it was I had a mate of mine, Roger Seymour. He's now a professor. So he was a nuclear engineer. And I met him when I was very, very young. He was, he was only about eight years older than me. Um, when we did Polaris, because the submarine that we put the missile in was, was called the George Washington. And it was a first nuke. And it was big, so you could stand Polaris up. Submarines push out horizontally. And so they cut it in half and banged a 13-metre section in and sealed it up. And she still behaved as a new... It went deep. And the missile fired on the date we said that was set in 1956. And we fired it on the 1st of October when it was meant to be. Everybody was on the planet. Every man and his dog was doing something. And all this integration of, of the data. Now, who cares about planning? Why do we need a planner, you'll get asked? Yeah, because you can't start a project up without understanding what it consists of. And who is the one and only person that can take a concept of a design and tell you how many nails and screws you need and how much image is it? The Swedish had a system, 1966, called the CISFB. And it was five lots of four alphanumeric characters, upper and lower case. And you could describe all this stuff, you coded it up with the QS. And so you, you could see what you had of every item. So if you know exactly what every item is in your project, and then you go and look for the cost, nowadays all this stuff's online, you now got a fair idea about your supply chain. Contractors now just buy from a supply chain. They don't negotiate. See, I go out, I live in a lot of hotels, especially so I don't have to come back home at night sometimes. And I have a, I've organized myself a deal with Accor. I was working in Canberra for two years, four nights every week. And it was costing me $3,000, bed and breakfast and flights. And so I chatted up the general manager and I said, listen, I'm going to spend 160 nights in this hotel of yours. And it's going to cost me this much money. Now, I want to be in here because it's only 500 meters to the office. And the next year is hotels one and a bit. So I said, what sort of deal could you do for me? She chopped it in half. Only time I couldn't get the price was if, if Parliament was sitting and they'd overflowed. Fortunately, Parliament's a long way away in Canberra from where I was. But it's negotiate. 
And I said, when we did the Royal Adelaide Hospital, which was a classic stuff up, 1.8 billion, supposed to fit, start on 6th of June. Oh, it's, yeah, it's start time now, 11th of June it started in 2011 and was meant to be, had a technical handover 19th of January 2016 and move in commercial acceptance by the state government of the hospital on the 16th of April. Well, it didn't quite get that way. We had a heroic project director who was on three quarters of a million dollar salary, which, you know, 1.8 billion projects, not really all that cool. But he was a pencil sharpener and he, he fired one of the most critical subbies, which was mechanical services. It was smart, wasn't it? Like air conditioning, fire water, water. You know, mechanical service, good grief. You know, I mean, you got to, why'd you do that? Then, of course, they couldn't find anybody, could they? Yeah. So exactly. we had a three-month hiatus while we, and what we did, we swapped the way we were building the hospital around. That took us 12 weeks to reschedule. Mm. Never caught yeah. it up. And it, yeah. it finished up costing a billion more, and it was a year late. But it wasn't yep. the same post. Well, they added some mm. more MRIs. We had 10 MRIs at 10 million each. There was 800 mm. wards all with opening windows, 50 operating theatres, 10 of which were daycare. And if you wanted, people decide they didn't like these hermetically sealed windows. And so what happened, you could go up to the window if you had somebody. The walls were basically a single person. They had, a, there was two double beds, so a partner could stay. And you could press the button and it would open the window electrically. And then it would send a signal down to the old air conditioning computer and said, battle off the air conditioning, drop the amount of air you're going to pump, which, according to the standard, was 203 litres per minute. We dropped it down to about 50 litres. Because if we'd have kept the air going, that would have cost God knows how many millions of dollars over the lifetime of the hospital. Well, quick fly around. OK, we could talk for hours. First question, how do you, how do you start your day? Well, besides the obvious of leaving out of bed, I get up about up at five, quarter to six every day. And I whack on the ABC early morning breakfast show, have a coffee, get myself organized. I do all the domestic work around the house because it's only me. And so I've got to get that out of the way. And then I, have a, I do my breakfast at seven and I'm onto the computer at eight. So I read the newspaper, listen, see what's gone on during the day. And because nobody else does. And it's always a good idea with all these Zooms and meetings, you, you throw a topic in. <laughs> oh, goodness me. It's quite funny. And then I just keep going. And I plan everything to work. And I I have calendars. like I keep them in my head. You, you can plan. You can get a square box. You can do things. But you've got to live the life that's turning over in front of you. Positive attitude. Yeah. When are you most productive? While I'm awake, <laughs> which is most of the day. I don't hey. go up and down, no. Yeah, that be, being in the moment, isn't it? It's being, in the, being present, being present in the moment. I, in, I interact fine. When we did Zoom, and I still teaching, and they decided to do a block of five hours with a 30-minute interval because they didn't want to come in four separate times. So I said, well, I'm not coming in. And I did it from here, straight bang straight out yeah. and i'm listening i don't know how many were actually there because all of a sudden their faces disappear you know you suddenly get a photo and you go yeah 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 that was interesting especially when i keep reminding them i would say something when people you're not certain if they're listening or what they're doing you say you do realize that this lecture is worth 40 percent of this month's marks don't you but what's something new happening in your life right now i think i'm going to do some work with stutler henke they, the Rob Richards, who's the head, one of the head honchos, we know each other from way back. During COVID, there was a competition. They claimed that their resource scheduling algorithm was the best on the market. And of course, if anything's going to get my attention, somebody telling me they got a better algorithm than I got because I can prove mine's better and everything on the market because we keep doing constantly. I check the software, things change. You've got to understand. You can't be on the top of the man all your life. You're going to fall off. And to build up a good relation with Rob, that was, was on, on that screen. And he suddenly said, I've just thought of something totally mad. So I thought, oh, that's interesting. 
let's find out what he wanted to do is for us to conjoin and i think i could be able to make microplan and feed his hundred thousand dollar system so the new idea now in submarine construction shipbuilding because i've joined a mob called lidoc and it's a massive organization it has four verticals well five now they got a mob called gibson cox build submarines and surface vessels definitely part of my interest they also run healthcare. Well, I've been in healthcare 30, 40 years, and they do software and communications and IT. Well, I've been doing that since 1954. And then they're doing maritime surveillance. I used to do a lot of work on the PC3 Orions down in, in Edinburgh in South Australia, and they were the anti-warfare. So they used to go out, and they would fly 100 feet above the water. And they'd come back soaked in bloody salt. We have to wash them now. And I worked, I had four guys, and we created a big template to keep that fleet flying. And the aircraft will fly for 48 hours. They just shut two of the engines off. It's actually a super constellation. You'd be young enough, old, whatever, to remember them <laughs> before the jets came out. That's how you say. So we'd start to have a, they're in Boeing, and I, I wrote Boeing's uh, value manual. And I wow, tend to amazing. author a lot of stuff. Yeah, I can give you a copy if you like. It's so what does what does adventure look like to you, Raf? Well, adventure thing is getting my middle daughter to do what she needs to do, and then we go places. She loves going. She's got a a boyfriend who's out on the oil rigs, but I like going out and looking at things. The biggest adventure I've just done, which was really good fun, is I got invited to have tea with the Governor General. A government house and i took a net with me and the adventure is or the thing it's going to be a really good is to raise three million dollars because there's some goodies we want to buy the australiana fund was founded by malcolm fraser's wife tamara malcolm fraser was the prime minister after gough whitlam so he was prime minister from 75 to 83 and his wife tamara and they're good victorians down in the country and not far from where one of our vineyards is and she looked at what was in government house, looked at what was in the various buildings, and it was all plaster ducks up the wall, shades of Edna Everidge and Barry Humphreys. And Malcolm gave her three million, and she was doing what Jackie Kennedy had done. And I love all the old stuff. I don't, today's architecture, Lego blocks. I mean, what thing would you love to do that might surprise your friends and family? Well, I certainly won't get married again. I would probably take all my kids on a round world trip first class. Oh, who or what inspires and motivates you? Good question. Well, Ben Flivberg and there's a there's a person called Chris Carson who works for Arcadis. He and I are sick of thieves and he lives in in in, uh, in Virginia. And my oh, my other good mate, Tim Mather. He's got a software company. He lives in Bellevue and we've got the same silly sense of humour. And I've got all these guys onto the Goon Show because the Goons were big here. And as obviously they were in England. But I wouldn't mind running another big conference. That would be a bit of an adventure, I can tell you. But the price is now. And now I've got to consider I've taken up a full time job. Mind you, if somebody's, if I can convince Stott the Key to throw half a million dollars at me, then I might just stop and we'll go software and again. That would be an adventure. Name a challenge that you overcame that changed your life. I suppose having cancer in the leg slowed me down a bit. I got over that. And as I said, I don't take any medicines. Catherine insists I have to have magnesium and zinc because of the muscles. But oh, I guess it was actually becoming the senior project person for Australian Hospital Care because that, that led me down another rabbit hole, which then gave us 10 years around here in Victoria. Then I did, oh, and of course, that got us up to build the cancer hospital in Sudbury in Ontario and then of course at the same time I got a teaching post at the Shanxi in Xi'an aeronautical nautical polytechnic and we went to see all those uh, terracotta soldiers so that was an inter that was a really cool time because you I wouldn't have done that if I hadn't actually got the Trobe hospital built so the final question then Raf for you and I think you'll quite enjoy this one. What advice would you give to your young self? You'd be listening to all these people. Keep at it. 
you'll get there. Never had any doubts because I was, it's not a being force. It's what I'm, I'm, you really got to understand how your brain works and use it because it's the thing that keeps you alive. It, all the pharmaceuticals you need, you can generate in your body. I can manage what I need to do things. I mean, I get to point now, um, bones are stuck. Well, I mean, they're, they're nearly 84, only another month and I'll be 84. So they wear a bit, but I still got my own hips. I've got my own knees. I've got my own shoulders. And I know people 20 years younger than me that don't. See, at the moment, I'm working cyber. See, that's a new adventure as well. Yeah. Oh, well, I started AI with Professor Ross Garner in uh, University of New South Wales, 1986. In fact, I was the first person ever gave a lecture in Australia on AI in 1986. It was just, I'd written a paper while I was still at ICL, but the conference wasn't until November. And I didn't know whether they would let me, whether ICL would let me present it. Because in those days when you worked, I mean, that was my first and one and only job. Now I'm only doing my second job and 36 years between the two of them. And um, it was like a lot of the early critical path stuff, you never got attribution. I know I won't do, if you're not going to, if I'm not getting attribution, sorry, I'm not going to write. We wrote the book, the three of us, we did everything. And the manager who gave us a hard time never contributed, but his name's all over it. And so it's, you know, you go, well, we went out in the field. Who was up at 3 a.m. in the morning trying to fix up a bunch of punch cars down at Pfizer's in Kent? Because we were flying all around Europe to get an hour's computer time so we could compile the program. This is back in 1961. My cousin David with me. We had 150,000 punch cards and they were in boxes of 2,000. So we had all these trays in a special device which had to go on board as cargo. But every now and again, we got up on truck when we went around the UK. So we go to Edinburgh. And we got to Glasgow, and then we went to Bristol, and then we went to Pfizer's down in Kent. And we one computer every night during, when they stopped working, so we could have a graveyard shift. And the guy was, he, God, he, he was irritable, because he had to stay, because Pfizer's being American, and he had to stay. And so we decided, we're going to give him a bit of our time. So David said, should we drop some punch cards? Oh, yeah, why not? So he spilled some trays, went everywhere. And he went absolutely nuts. And we said, oh, dear, that's a problem. We'll have to be here another three or four hours, won't we? <laughs> what he didn't know was the last eight columns on a punch card is a sequence number. We just stuffed it into the card reader. And what do you know? It goes on a mag tape. Oh, what can you do with images on a mag tape? You can sort them. So we just thought the whole dip back into secrets again. Raf, it's been an absolute pleasure and thank you so much for giving us your time. All right, young man. That's been, I think, it's a lot of fun. I mean, okay, Raf, on that notice, I'll let you go. <laughs> thank you so much. It's been heaps of fun having a rabbit to somebody you don't know. It's terrific. We're now mate, so you can't escape. Fantastic. That's wonderful. <laughs> Thanks for joining us on Construction Cash Flow, sponsored by Know Your Numbers. Remember, when you know your numbers, you're in control of your destiny. Keep building your success story and don't forget to explore further by following the link in the podcast notes.